Oh, now that's an interesting question. Complete mistake, actually. Uh, no, seriously, seriously. An awful lot of science is serendipity. I was working on <coughs> what causes weight loss in disease. Um, wh why, why is weight loss the biggest cause of death and cancer and sepsis and so on? And I knew that in stroke, um, that caused a lot of weight loss and a high fever. And I was working on IL-1 and fever at the time. And so we, we blocked IL-1 thinking we would reduce the fever and the weight loss, and we did, but we also reduced the damage. So I had to completely change fields. So it wasn't, I suddenly saw, oh, the brain is what I'm going to work on. It was a complete accident. Yeah, there's, th there's no good evidence that they cause damage in adults. Um, there is concern about the heat generated th with very extensive use. Um, it's not absolutely proven, but, but if I was going to advise, I would say, you know, five minutes, not an hour. Um, there is a concern about very young people um, where there is some evidence for potential brain damage. It's, it's not very clear, though, but there's certainly uh, the advice out now is that children under 10 shouldn't have um, use uh, mobile phones excessively. Don't know if you've noticed, I don't think it's been done officially, but I think the signals have been reduced on all the transmitters. I don't know if some of you noticed more difficulty getting a signal uh, in a lot of places, but uh, there's, there's a rumour that the signal strength has been reduced slightly. Yeah, stem cell therapy uh, is being developed for the use in stroke. It's at the stage of the first clinical trial at the moment. Uh, the animal studies are quite promising. Now, of course, the question is, can you get, re get all the connections? You just don't want the cells to sit there. That's of no help at all. Well, first of all, we know that they do differentiate into I become neurons and glia. That, that's, that's true. And, and it does appear that you can get functional recovery. The worry will be if you cause a secondary inflammation. So at the moment, there are small clinical trials uh, being undertaken. There have been some in Parkinson's with some success, um, but stroke is the one that actually people are looking at now. So it's too early to say yes, but it's certainly being looked at. It depends. I mean, the answer could be any. So if you want to understand human behaviour, which if you like is psychology, or what goes wrong with human behaviour, uh, which is psychiatry, then it would it will be largely um, working with people and seeing how they behave. It involves some brain imaging and so on. If you want to understand neurological diseases, like the ones that I've highlighted, then it could be anything from working with patients with those diseases to working on computers. So there are lots, of, it, it depends on which aspect, and they're all important in understanding brain disease. Everything from social interaction to complex molecular biology and imaging. Yes, but it's a highly complex uh, genetic background. So in other words, you get what you call linkages, and, and there is more association with some diseases than others. There are some forms of um, Alzheimer's where it is an absolutely direct, a single gene that's defect, and you know that that's going to cause Alzheimer's. In the vast majority of cases, whether it's uh, the likelihood of getting a stroke or of getting depression or schizophrenia or anything else, there is an, a, a genetic component, but it's not been well um, linked. Um, so, for example, you can say if two or more of your family have a certain disorder, there is a so much greater chance, but we, can't, we don't know. It's, and and it's, it's um, polygenetic. In other words, there are lots of genes involved, so we don't understand the detail. In fact, there was a paper published just two weeks ago from Manchester from one of my colleagues on the identification of a new gene involved in a very important form of dementia called frontotemporal de dementia. And the, the gene defects accounts for nearly half of all cases. So that's a very strong linkage. Why hasn't it been selected out? Because there's been no pressure. Most of the disorders I've been talking about, the ones that occur like stroke or Alzheimer's, um, true to some extent of psychiatric disorders, first of all, they occur after the age of reproduction. So there wouldn't be a selective pressure against it. So if you get a disease when you're 50, what does it matter? You've already passed your genes on to somebody. And secondly, of course, um, in, at a time when evolution impacted on humans, 
most humans only live to the age of 30. Uh, and so these are, would never have appeared. I mean, it may be that n hardly anybody ever had a stroke back in caveman days. Uh, they would have had head injuries, but there are probably lots of things that made you susceptible to that, like how many fights you got into or whether you went out fighting other animals. So the answer is that there hasn't been a genetic pressure uh, to select against it. Um, interestingly, what we're starting to see now is a lot of these uh, diseases in our pets, um, you know, dogs, cats, get strokes. Um, and that's partly because we haven't selected against it and partly because uh, they're living a Western lifestyle. We don't exercise them as much as we used to and we give them more food than they used to get and they get obese and they get exactly the same. Yeah, we, we, we know there are certain genes that predispose. Um, so there are certain genes that predispose towards getting atherosclerosis because, I mean, w the main risk factors I told you, but there are slim, healthy, fit people who do get strokes, just like there are slim, healthy, fit people who get heart attacks. I, I gave a public law uh, talk a few months ago and a lady came up to me at the end and she said her husband had a massive stroke at the age of 34 and the year after his brother had one at the age of 35. Well, that surely has to be, you know, and I referred them on to a genetic screening to see if they could find them. So there are genetic factors uh, and there are cases where we just don't know. The, the commonest cause of stroke where, where there's a blockage is largely related to atherosclerosis. But subarachnoid hemorrhage, although there are certain factors, it, it's silent. People are born with an aneurysm in their brain. One in 20 people, that means a lot of people in this room, will have a small aneurysm in their brain. For the vast majority of you, it'll be absolutely fine. We know there's no point in screening for it because it'll be fine most of the time. An intracerebral hemorrhage, where there's a blood vessel within, deep within the brain that bursts, we just don't have any idea. We don't have any warning of it at all. So it's a mixture. So the blocker of IL-1 that we are testing in stroke patients is now being tested in mainland Europe on um, babies who they believe are at risk. Um, interesting, we don't really know the causes of birth asphyxia, but a common, two common causes is very high blood pressure in the mother, which can damage the placenta, and the other is the mother having a serious infection. And of course, that infection would release molecules like IL-1. But there's a trial going on now in babies. Um, it, it gets degraded gradually, is one thing. Um, it gets removed by the cerebral spinal fluid, which, like blood, flows. It isn't static. It runs in and out. So just like other things, it, it, it's got a half-life. In fact, its half-life in the, in the blood is only about seven minutes. It's cleared by the kidney. In cerebral spinal fluid, its half-life is several hours, and it gradually gets broken down. And then the other thing that happens after an injury in the brain, as in other tissues, in other tissues, it's macrophages. In the brain, it's microglia. They come and eat damaged tissue. They literally phagocytose, but eat them and degrade it. So that's when all our host defense responses start to kick in and we start to get repair and recovery. No, the question is, are stroke patients put in isolation? I guess you're thinking to reduce the chances of infection. No, this has only been realized very recently. But we're starting to realise, or the clinicians are, that things like, that we used to ignore, like oral hygiene, is actually very important. We just used to never think about brushing the teeth of patients who's had a stroke. But they very often have difficulty swallowing. They can aspirate into their lungs the contents of their mouth. And, and obviously, if that's not clean. So hygiene is, is considered important, much more important than it used to be. And we do now uh, advise relatives with... Um, an ongoing infection, not, not to go in to visit. On cardiac care units, you don't go in if you've got it. On stroke units now, you're asked if you have an infection and wash your hands and so on. But it's only been very recent that we've ever thought about it. OK, so biology has to be the structure of DNA, I think, because it spawned our understanding of... Um, how genes work and understanding of disease. So that was quite some time ago. I think that's probably the most e exciting breakthrough that I can think of. Uh, more widely in physical sciences, I could not possibly say anything other than the discovery of graphene, which was made at this university and won us the Nobel Prize last year. What a fitting way to end. Thank you very much. Thank you.